And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Good to have you here. And we have a few more seats, Leah and Jason. I think you can find one or two. Let's all stand, and we're going to open our service tonight in prayer. I'm so glad you're here. If you are here, those of you that aren't here, uh, we wish you were here, but we're glad you're joining us online. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you so much for giving us another day. Uh, you are so good to us. And uh, just the fact you gave us last week uh, was a gift that we didn't deserve. And here you've given us another day. And, and Lord, we pray that you'd help us to rejoice and be glad in it, to honor you. This is the day which you have made. And I pray as we worship you that you would be glorified in every aspect of our service. Pray that you would minister through your word. Thank you, Father, that it is your word that is quick, it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And we pray that tonight we'd be fed heavenly manna, and that you would be glorified again in every way. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love for us. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll open up to hymn 343, Rescue the Perishing, hymn 343. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep for the erring one, lift up the fallen, Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting. Waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, Patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer, Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, just a couple of announcements if uh, you weren't here or weren't online this morning. Uh, this is uh, from Josh Noble. We you know we, we were concerned about his uh, leg. It was in a boot. Uh, because of, uh, okay, results of Josh Josh's doctor's appointment this past Tuesday, because of prayer, not only is there no cyst, but the fracture that was there was healed very well and that I should be able to start running in a couple of weeks. And very importantly, I'm totally good to go to South Korea on June 7th. God answered prayer in a miraculous way, and I haven't even left for orientation yet. He'll be, Josh will be going uh, owner to orientation on June 2nd. Uh, where's that at? That's down south somewhere, That's Alabama or something like that. And then they will leave uh, 
on June 7th for Seoul and arrive on the 8th. So we still need prayers for, for traveling and for everything else. And uh, keep uh, Serena Nino and uh, Ethan Ollis in prayer for uh, physical recovery. This time I have the ushers come forward as we take our tithes and offerings. Let's bow for prayer, please. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this church. We thank you that the body of believers are the church, Lord. We just thank you for the building that we meet in, Lord. We thank you that the offerings have always provided all of our needs, Lord. We ask that you would continue with that and uh, bless those who can give, Lord, and uh, uh, those uh, who, who may not be able to, Lord. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. All right, please take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 5 for a scripture reading. 1 John chapter 5. And let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to read the first five verses. Uh, the first three we looked at last week, but for context, I'll read the first five. And then verses four and five is the text that we're going to look at tonight. First John chapter five, verses one through five. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We uh, are so grateful that uh, we are not following just a, an, we're not following a dead book. We're following your living word. We're so thankful that you communicate it to mankind through the scriptures. And that Jesus Christ, the living word, has communicated through the written word. And Lord, we pray knowing that your word is, is powerful. We pray that you would do a work in our hearts tonight as this, the, the Bible is proclaimed. May we be receptive to the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the, the scriptures. Pray that you would do a great work to save the lost, to strengthen the church, and, and restore the backslider. We ask your blessing on every aspect of tonight. And again, thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you again. Uh, Lord, we're so confident, so thankful that you sit on the throne and that you are intimately involved in the affairs of men. And we look forward to that day when our faith becomes sight. But Lord, until then, bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll turn to hymn 376. Ask ye what great thing I know, hymn 376, and it's to the tune of Take My Life, hymn 376. Ask ye what great thing I know that delights and stirs me so, what the high reward I win, whose the name I glory in, Jesus Christ the crucified. Who defeats my fiercest foes? Who consoles my saddest woes? Who receives my fainting heart, healing all its hidden smart? Jesus Christ, the crucified. Who is life in life to me? Who the death of death will be? Who will place me on his right with a countless hope of light? Jesus Christ the crucified. This is that great thing I know, this delights and stirs me so. Faith in him who died to save, him who triumphed o'er the grave, Jesus Christ the crucified. Amen. Now, I don't know if you got scared when you heard Dave say the name of the song. I'm like, oh no. We have a small group. We don't have, I've never even heard of this. And then he redeemed us by saying it's to the tune of. Hallelujah for that. <laughs> this week I was at a conference and uh, they were singing hymns, I, different group, never heard of half these hymns. And, and then one of the hymns, never heard of, but it was to the, um, one of those patriotic, like the national. And, and I'm like, oh, I know this one. So it really helps when you know the tune. And then you can f focus on the words. And what a blessing that song was. So praise the Lord. All right, let's turn, to fir turn back to 1 John chapter 5. As we go verse by verse, this is the 45th. If I've been keeping track right, I think I have. This is the 45th message. We're now in the last chapter. And we are looking at the, the love book, aren't we? And we are looking at the, the, the wonderful book of 1 John. And tonight we're going to look at verse 4 and 5. But it's important that we read verse 3, which, in fact, verse 4 starts out, for, so it, you have to read what's before it because it's a continuing flowing thought. It's a problem with chopping up a message. When Paul wrote this, it was a letter. It was one long letter read continuously, uh, you know, that all the words are together. So when we chop it up, it's important that we keep, always important that we keep things in context. So look at verse 3. It says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. We looked at that last Sunday, happy commandments. But we've also looked at, you know, this, this challenge about keeping the commandments is, he's hitting this yet again. Uh, so again, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous for, in light of what he just said, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now that's connected to what he just said. The idea of keeping God's commandments. The idea, and it goes back to this general theme of you know, he that doesn't sin, he that keeps his commandments, he that walks in the light versus darkness. Well, this is, again, he says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. 
And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then verse 5, he again uses this phrase, overcoming the world. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And I want to read um, the expositor Alexander McLaren wrote this statement commenting on verse 4. And it's a, it's a good introduction and a good observation in fact, in our morning, in our Bible study hour, we were talking about repentance and quick prayerism, easy believism, and we're talking about the importance of repentance. And there are people that are anti-repentance, and they will often use John's, right, the Gospel of John, and the fact that he doesn't, in the Gospel of John, repentance is not, is not mentioned, or in the Epistle of John. There's no, the word repentance is not found in 1 John. But to say that that concept is, is, is absent is certainly to do it a disfavor. So listen to what Alexander McLaren said. He said, No New Testament writer makes such frequent use of the metaphors of combat and victory as this gentle apostle John. None of them seem to have conceived so habitually of the Christian life as being a conflict. And in none of their writings does the clear note of victory in the use of that word overcometh ring out so constantly as it does in those of the very apostle of love. He's talking about John, of course. Equally characteristic of John's writings is the prominence which he gives to the still contemplation of and abiding in Christ. These two conceptions of the Christian life appear to be discordant, contrary, but are really harmonious. And then he says, there is no doubt where John learned the phrase about being overcomers. Once he had heard it in a time and in a place which stamped it on his memory forever. We just quoted this this morning. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Remember Jesus Christ said that uh, in his hour before Gethsemane. So we're going to talk about the idea of overcoming the world. One of three things, my goal tonight, the outline, is uh, overcoming the world. What does it mean? Number two, what does it not mean? And then thirdly, how does it look? So let's, let's pray again. I want to pray for Serena. I want to pray for uh, Ethan. And then we'll jump right into our, our text. Father, we're, we're so grateful that we can come to you any time, night or day, that you invite us to, and that you, you want us to pray without ceasing. And Father, we thank you that you are tending to the cares of our congregation and our friends, friends of the church. Uh, Father, I want to lift up to you our sister Serena, as she uh, is recovering from surgery. Pray for healing for her. I want to lift up John Anderson and Amelia as they also, Father, are uh, on the healing and on the mend from their cancer treatment. And I pray that you would just touch these bodies. And then for, for young Ethan, Father, we thank you for him and for his family. We love the Alice family. Lord, we pray for this young man that you would encourage him. Father, help him not to get discouraged. And, and when he is down, Father, and struggling, we pray that that he would look to you, that you would lift him up during those times. And we know there'll be some down times, Father. Pray that you would rejuvenate his body and that you would take uh, what the devil no doubt intended for evil and you'd use it for good. In his life and the Alice's, we pray for, for uh, all of Ethan's siblings that you'd bless them. And thank you, Lord, that thank you for the love that the family has one for another, for the the siblings rallying around Ethan. We just pray that that would happen and continue and that they would also draw near to you. Bless Bill and Jen. So thankful for this couple. Father, please, please be with them in a very special way. I also want to pray for Pat Sanino, Father, and, and I just ask you to touch her body and heal her that, that uh, her um, body would get to the point where she, she can have that surgery. Just encourage Jim's heart. We lift them up to you. And uh, Lord, there's many others. I pray for Joanne Tomkowitz, uh, that you would bless her. I pray for Gore and for Lana, 
so many people, Lord, that we just ask your healing hand to be upon them. And now, Lord, we're excited about being able to open the Scriptures. Pray you'd bless the Word. And we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we are in 1 John, and we are talking about overcoming the world. And uh, so, first of all, what is that? Again, verse 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And then verse 5, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Let me go back to read, because virtually everything John's been dealing with, especially at this point in his letter, He's already brought these things up. And so it's good for us to go back and remember what he said earlier about these topics. So he's already talked about overcoming in various ways. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. And then 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But there are some other things John does, it says. For example, in 1 John 2, 29, he says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Remember, we've been hitting that theme. Born, you know, doeth righteousness, keeps his commandments. 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. So this is a theme that he's been hitting over and over again. So what does, what does it mean to be overcomers of the world? Basically what John is talking about, he's talking about victory over sin dominating our lives. Victory over carnality. Overcoming the world. When we talk about worldliness, worldliness is something that happens when a professing believer uh, is, is living a defeated life. So we use the term, and the scripture uses a term, to describe someone that has been overcome by the world as carnal. So keep in mind, not every Christian would be labeled as carnal. I want to keep that in mind because John is talking about overcoming the world. Listen to what Paul said. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. And remember, this does not apply to every born-again believer. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual. So there are people that Paul would write to that he would speak to them because they were spiritually-minded Christians. He said, I couldn't write unto you as unto them that are spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. Carnal means of the flesh. And the word carnival comes from that. But again, he says, you are yet carnal. And here's his example. For whereas... There is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? In other words, you're living like the world who does not have Christ. And Paul was writing to them. And so there are believers that have been overcome by the world. And John is writing to challenge us because, again, we... Uh, Whoever is born of God overcometh the world. So what we're talking about is the victory. Overcoming the world acknowledges, first of all, that there's a battle. Remember McLaren's statement that this, you know, John uses the, these terms even more so than Paul a little bit. Uh, the, these battle terms. And, and he uses the term overcoming. There is a battle going on. You know that. If you are a born-again child of God, you know there is a battle. Listen to some of these verses. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. 
And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Paul explained it this way. And keep in mind in, in Romans 7, because some people would look at Romans 7 to excuse their sin and say, wow, Paul really lived a defeated life. No, he doesn't. He, he acknowledges the battle that goes on. But keep in mind that Paul in Romans 7 is talking about how the law affects sin. He says this in verse 11. For sin, taking a com- occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And so he asks this question. Was then that which is good made death unto me? He's talking about how the law condemns us. The law reveals sin in us. But he says, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And so he's going on, he's talking about how the entrance of God's perfect law exposes the sin that is in us. It's how we first got saved. So let's listen to what he says now, beginning verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. And then he goes on. And then, it, you know, that's kind of like uh, the verse in Galatians 5.17, some are, are expounded even more. There's a battle that goes on. And when the Spirit of God takes up residence in us, there is this ever-ascending battle in our lives between the flesh and the Spirit. But I want you to understand that when you and I are born again, we, because we are born of God, we have the ability to overcome the world. I remember, I've shared this before, I remember having a conversation as a young Christian now, many of you met John Caputo. He's been here. And uh, John apparently, again, got saved just a few a year or two before I did. I did not know that. He was a spiritual giant to my mind. He's the one that led me to the Lord. But I remember a group of us that, that came to the Bible study had a, a secret discussion. And, and I've realized that a lot of Christians have these secret discussions. I've heard them uh, ever since. But here was our secret discussion. I or another friend said to the other, you think John sins? We actually, we, we, said, we had that conversation. And, and we're all thinking, you know, this question popped up and we're like, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine him sinning, you know. And we really thought that. Now I've heard, I've heard that question then later. Uh, I heard people in church talking about that with Pastor Griffith. You think, you think Pastor Griffith sins? And then since then I've heard people that even national religious, especially, I should say this, especially, you know, when somebody is in the limelight or somebody, the further away you get, um, the more it appears that people are sinless. And I've heard this, I remember hearing Christians about a, a particular religious leader that was very popular in the 70s and 80s. You think this guy sins? Well, you know what, I've been, I've been saved now for 40 years and walking with ministry people for years, and I can tell you, yes, they sin. I will tell you that. You know, just count on it. Uh, and anyone that teaches you, in fact, anyone that comes across, and this is the danger, anyone that comes across, even a spiritually minded person, that would give you the impression or even say that they don't sin, watch out for that. Now when I say that, That is not to say that, you know, Christians, pastors, godly men of God, and women of God, they sin. But that is not to say that, and and here's the danger. In fact, just, there's apparently a video that went viral recently, just found out about it, of a pastor in Indiana that confessed to his church that he had sinned. And the video is he's, he's in front of the church and he's confessing that he 
He committed adultery. And God bless him for acknowledging it. Uh, and he was stepping down from ministry, so praise the Lord for that. But, and, and you know, that's a very grievous thing. But it was so much more than what he admitted. And apparently, uh, he, had, he had violated a young 16-year-old 20 years ago while she was wearing her purity ring. Uh, and she and her husband, she's in her late 30s or 40s, she got up. And praise the Lord, the church allowed her to do this. Be careful of people that try to sweep things under the carpet. And so the church let her do this. And so there's the guy, and it's on video. And, and you know, he's, he's supposedly having a humble moment where he's admitting. And then she comes up and she's like, wait a minute. And she kind of shares the gravity of the whole thing. And it is tragic. It is tragic. So when we talk about the fact, well, everybody sins, and in those situations, that is not saying that every believer and every man or woman of God commits gross immorality. In fact, John is saying just the opposite. So we want to talk about this idea of overcoming the world. But let me, let me now go to point two. What does it not mean? What does it not mean? And that goes to, to this question. I want to been thinking about this recently. There's a theological statement that people will debate. Remember, I think it was in Bible school where we debated this issue. And it's probably, this question I think is asked at ordination councils. And here's the question. I want you to think about it, okay? Don't answer out loud, okay? Was Jesus not able to sin or was he able not to sin? Okay, think about that. Was Jesus able not to sin or was Jesus not able to sin? I know, it's, that's why sometimes the theological questions can be picky uni, I should say, you know. But, you know, it's good, it's good for us to think about these things, you know. Because I want you to think about, because here's what the Bible says. And, and this, folks, this is very clear. This is everything, because what we're talking about tonight is not based upon what we do, but about what Christ did. And so everything is wrapped up in that. The Bible makes it very clear. Listen to some of these verses. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, to be sin for us, speaking of Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, And ye know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Now here's the challenge. There is a verse in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 that says that Jesus was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And that has been scrutinized and dissected a million different ways that he was in all points tempted like as we are. And so that brings up the question, if Jesus was in all points tempted like we are, could he have sinned? And, and it's important that you and I understand. Jesus was God, and he was without sin. He could not sin. We well, say if he could not sin, then he, was he really tempted in all points? He was. The, ta the test, the temptation was legitimate. And by the way, and I love this point. This really helped me. When Jesus Christ was tempted, he could have relied on his deity. For example, in Luke chapter 4 and, and, and Matthew, when the devil tempts him, he, he could have just laughed and said, I'm God. You're not going to get me to budge. What are you talking about? But Jesus did not rely upon his deity. He relied upon it. I think perhaps he did this, folks, as an example. Though he could not have sinned, what he used to combat sin was the Word of God. Even though the devil threw the Scriptures at him, 
That's, that was the sword of the Spirit. That's what He used. He would quote the Scriptures. And that's what we have. But there are some groups out there that believe that on this side of glory, Christians can reach the point of sinless perfection. And it is so important that you understand. And, and you know, I know even some ministries where they flirt in that area. Like I, I remember reading a teacher that I appreciate some of the stuff this guy writes, but he came out with a commentary and, and it was so hovering over that area of the fact that we could, you know, not sin. And it, it just made it very muddy. Folks, the Bible makes it clear. In fact, listen to some of these verses. 1 Kings 8 and verse 46, and then the same teaching is in 2 Chronicles 6.36. It's giving a scenario, and it says now, uh, if they sin against thee, and then in parentheses, two places it says, for there is no man that sinneth not, except for Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now this is, but keep this in mind. Those are, you know, you always have to keep Scripture balanced. Remember 1 John 3, 9? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So does the Bible contradict itself? Oh, there would be many that would say, yeah, absolutely it does. There's, so we just throw it away. But every person that understands that the, the Bible is the revelation of God and have looked beyond the surface... Whenever there's a seeming contradiction, there's a reason for that. Usually, it exposes something of our understanding. And when you dig deeper into it, it unfolds wondrous truths. And of course, what first, in 1 John, all these statements about sinning not, is not saying that we can reach sinless perfection. Please understand that. There's a hymn by Robbie Robertson, I think it is. And I think of this phrase... I'm trying to think of the, of the hymn. Um, Praise the mountain fixed upon. What song is that? Here's how. What's that? Come thou fount. And is that not the one that says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Folks, that communicates the challenge that we have to overcome the world. Anyone that comes along or gives you the impression that they are not prone to wander and prone to leave the God they love is giving you a false impression and waving a major flag. Because we are all in this flesh. We are all prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. You ever been there? You ever said that? Lord, I feel it. You know, it's absolutely. So what's the challenge? I've read this quote here many times. It's from a child, child rearing book. And um, I appreciate some of the things. Appreciate this. this. This writer said this. And it was to homeschool parents. As you know, we homeschool. And uh, there's so many benefits. I'm, I'm glad that we have. Uh, but there's, uh, I understand that's not for everyone. Uh, and, and, and in fact, here's, here's he, listen to what he says. Mer many parents do a careful job of quarantining their children from the world, but fail to inoculate them against the eventual and inevitable exposure to evil. Folks, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> How do you inoculate someone from the in inevitable ex exposure to evil? I want to be inoculated, you know? He says, parents somehow think that if they can just keep their children isolated until they get to be older teens, then the danger will have passed. Ha, 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 ha. If we protect our children until they are old enough to leave home, but fail to... And by the way, everything he says about children, I put adults too. You know, it, it applies. If we fail to prepare them, us, within, to triumph over the world's alluring environment, we've not prepared them at all. We've actually made them vulnerable. An unused character can grow as weak as an unused limb. Worldliness is not a condition of the world. It is a condition of the soul. When we isolate our children, 
or ourselves from the world, we may forget that we are already, and they are already, infected. Children, and adults obviously, are born with and become carriers of the disease of carnality. A protected and separated home differs from the world only in degree, not in kind. The flesh of every child, every adult, and every criminal is identical. As a child matures, his flesh becomes increasingly vulnerable to every carnal opportunity. And as you know, society secretes opportunities to sin. The air is filled with it. The world is a carnival. And every child a, and every, child and every adult a potential customer. So understand that this battle to overcome the world and worldliness and carnality is the issue that we face. The only victory is our faith. So, over, how does it look? We, we won't go to the many scriptures, but especially in Paul's teachings, he, he uses this imagery. He says, put off the old man, and then put on the new man. And, and the challenge, and this goes back to in fact, let me read to you uh, a commentary that was such a blessing to me. On this idea, in fact, right here in the text in 1 John 5, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Since believing on Him is the key to being born of God, the key to victory is faith. Not only an initial come to the altar and get saved faith, but a constantly a consistently abiding faith and ongoing reliance and trust upon Jesus Christ. And then another commentator said this on the idea of the he who overcomes the world. The life of abiding faith and trust in Jesus Christ is the life that overcomes the pressures and temptations of the world. Okay, good, look, now look at the verse in there. Who is he that overcomes the world? This tells us we overcome, and here, here's the phrase I was looking for. This tells us we overcome primarily because of who we are in Christ, not because of what we do. And this is John's point here. Three times he talks about overcoming the world, and this is the victory, our obedience. No, this is the victory, our faith. So this tells us we overcome primarily because of who we are in Christ, not because of what we do. We overcome because we are born of God, and we are born of God because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Again, not in a mere intellectual sense, but we put our lives on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God for us. What an amazing thing. So, because we are born of God, we overcome the world. I want you to go back to 1 John chapter 1. This is a verse that has become very special to many of God's people. And it's one that probably, if you've been saved any length of time, um, you probably have this memorized. In fact, I probably just ought to say, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You ever quoted that to yourself? Why? Because you're a sinner, right? Amen. If we confess our sins, now think about this. What is confession? The word confess comes from a Greek term which literally means to agree with God. And is that not part of walking in the light? As we walk in the light, in fact, those that, this is condemnation that, dark, that uh, darkness has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. He that walks in the light, uh, I'm quoting from John chapter 3, very patch. Patch, patchwork. But the idea is that when we walk in the light, we, we come to the light so that our deeds will be made manifest. And as you and I grow, folks, it's like we're going in a haunted, in a, not a haunted. When I was a kid, I used to love exploring abandoned buildings. How many, anybody like that when you were younger? I was the only one. Okay. I used to love to do that. Now they have YouTubers that just go and find abandoned buildings and just explore. I love doing that. But I love going because, you know, first of all, these places have been abandoned. There's some places in the Poconos where they just go in and they, you know, these things have been, nobody's been in there for years. And you constantly, it's, they go around with a light 
and you're going into these dark crevices and seeing all these things, that's like our Christian life. As we walk in the light, it's like the Lord is constantly turning the corner and shining a flashlight like, oh, look what's there. And, okay, Lord, I'm going to work on cleaning this room up, <laughs> you know. And then, you know, and, and, but confess means we agree with God. So when God brings to light something you're doing, and I, if you're born again, you've had this experience continually. He shines a light on something, and, and the first thing you do is confess it. Agree with God. All right, Lord, I have sinned. If we confess our sins, and by the way, I heard this brought out. It's a good point. If someone was going to tell you they're going to, you're going to stand before the judge, what would you want to hear if you're guilty? What would you want to hear about the judge? You would want to hear that he is kind and merciful. Am I right? But what does this verse say? It doesn't say, if we confess our sins, he is kind and merciful. It's, when you're going to go see a judge, you don't want to hear, oh, he's faithful, he's just, he's, oh, he's really, you know, he's, he's right according to the law. You don't want to hear that. But isn't it interesting? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. In other words, he is a just God. But he's not faithful and just to condemn us. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Now that, that sin there that he forgives is the one that's connected to our confession. But keep this in mind. As this is the beautiful thing about the walk with, our walk with the Lord. As we go into that room and he shines the light on it, and we're like, oh. It's a very humbling thing to become aware of a sin that you didn't know you had. And then you see it. And then you deal with it, some longer than others. But you've confessed it. By the way, remember, he that, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. One of the ways you cover your sin is you don't confess it. I don't have a problem with that. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh it shall have mercy. If you've been saved for any length of time, how many times has the Lord turned the corner and shined the light in, in a room and you've had to confess it? Now, after you confess it and you come to the light, it's a blessing, isn't it, when you know you're forgiven? And there's kind of a sense, you know, it reminds me when I used to go to the priest and say, bless me, Father, I've sinned. And I shared those little three sins that I only knew, you know. And then and he'd say, you know, I absolve you from your sin. And there's like this sense that you're forgiven. You know, of course, once I understood what sin was, I understood that no man can forgive my sin. I understood that only Christ can forgive my sin. But when I confess a sin that I previously did not know about, there is a cleansing action. But folks, there's whole, still a whole lot more unrighteousness in me. Right? Haven't you found that out? Wouldn't it be great if we, um, if we could have a testimony time? If, if like this was the normal Christian experience, where every church had a testimony time of when you, you know, what was your experience where you, you dealt with sin? And you got rid of sin. I remember it was 2018, and uh, the Lord showed me my sin. And I remember I wrestled with it, and then, and then I confessed it. And it's now behind me. It's great. No more sin. Wouldn't that be great? But you know what we find? We clean, that room's cleaned out, and then we go into another part, and oh, there's a room more dirty than that one, you know? I mean, he's, when you realize what holiness is, folks, that when we're talking about sin, we're even talking about motives. We're talking about pride. We're talking about discontentment. We're talking about the tongue. There's so many things. That's why I love 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sin, the one that he's shining the light on, the one that he's pressing us about, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But he does something else. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is part of what is necessary to walk in the Spirit, to walk with Christ. If you and I had to be totally cleaned up 
And if we had to arrive at sinless perfection, and again, be so weary of anyone that gives you the impression. And I, in fact, there's a, 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 a TV, a radio, or no, an, what is radio? What's the internet? The internet. An online preacher that actually claimed this, I think this probably happens all the time, but he claimed that he stopped sinning like a couple years ago. That ought to be the biggest warning sign. And yet he had thousands and thousands of followers. People get impressed by that kind of stuff. That is a big warning flag. Folks, our standing is not in, in our perfection because we are far from. But our standing is in Christ. And as we walk in fellowship, now we can break that fellowship when we don't confess our sin. But please understand, when God's dealing with you something about, whatever He's dealing with you about, realize that, oh, there's a whole lot more that's going to come. Don't get overwhelmed by that. God is so good. I'm so glad God didn't... I, I've been saved for 40-some years. And on that walk with the Lord, He has showed me sin after sin after sin. And I, and I have grown. I have grown a little bit. But I could, you know, tell you of things that he has convicted me about that I've had to forsake and put away. And, and it's, I, I'd like to say there's five things. But <laughs> my wife just laughed. She's like, oh no, I could give you a whole lot more. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot more. But imagine if on the day we were saved, the Lord said, okay now, I am going to give you a list of all your sins. Uh, this is how great I am. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you everything you need to deal with. We'd be overwhelmed. He's so gracious to just, we just do one room at a time. You know, turn the corner. Some rooms are messier than others. Some rooms we stay in for a while, like, you know, but there's always another room. And folks, and I know this, I close with this. I shared this many times. Uh, when we early, many years ago, we, we had prison ministry at Delaware County Prison for nine years, and we picked up a man, Thomas Spears, who was in his 90s. We picked him up every Monday night. We went to George W. Hill, and George W. Hill. When you go in the main off uh, the main area, there's this huge. The place is huge. There's a huge hallway. I think it's like maybe a half a mile long. It's really long. And, and I did not choose this. But the group that we did was like the first one. Mr. Spears, the 90-year-old man, this was like at the very end. And so we'd be like, okay, goodbye, Mr. Spears. And he'd have to walk like, goodbye. You know, and he, but he had this vim in his step. And when we would bring him, it was such a blessing because we would always share what God was teaching him. But it was also kind of... a. It's like this man's in his 90s. And he's been saved since he was, I think he was 17. You do the math. That's a long time walking with the Lord. And he hadn't reached perfection yet. So do you think you will? And is that what God expects of us? No. He wants us to walk in the light. And here's the, here's the key. You and I will never become, will never become sinless but there is no sin that needs to conquer us. There's no individual sin that needs to have victory over us. Keep that in mind. You know, uh, Hebrews talks about the sins which such the, such, such, the sins which the 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 sins which doth so easily beset us. And there are sins that seem to trip certain people up. And sometimes they think, well, I'll never get victory over that. This is what John is talking about. No, there's no individual sin that cannot be overcome by the power of God. And if you think that, you, well, this is just something I'm always going to battle with, don't think that. He has given us the victory in our faith. Now also, understand and approach it like this is a conquerable sin. And go after it by the power of God. But then when you've conquered it, I caution you, what's the Bible say? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You know, and, and oftentimes, too many times I'll hear of a believer that falls back into a sin that they had 
way, way before they were saved, when they were living in the world, and then they get saved, they walk with the Lord, and then after decades, if they go back into the world, it's often those same sins. But please understand, there's no individual sin that needs to overcome you. You, in Christ, are an overcomer. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And Father, I thank You that it's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about our relationship with Him. And so, Father, I pray that You'd help us as we walk in the Spirit. Thank You, Father, that if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Father, help us not to believe the lie that there is uh, uh, any sin that uh, will just always be a part of our life. There are, help us not to believe the lie that there are unconquerable sins. And uh, Father, though we will always be sinners, and, and though the closer we get with you, the deeper our relationship will get, the more aware we will become of what you call sin. Uh, but Lord, in the meantime, help us not to live a defeated life. And we ask for your blessing. And thank you for the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymn books, let's stand, and we will close in song. Okay, let's turn to him 342, Jesus Saves, him 342. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell no sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. Her shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph of the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song to victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen, you're dismissed.